finally Wonka Belly has come back to YouTube. And I only did it because I've only been out so long because I've been playing Final Fantasy X, trying to complete that so I can review it. Really, if I played the whole game through straight, I could have finished it at Christmas Eve or December the 23rd if I was a little less picky on how I pace myself. However, I felt as if really the best way for me to review this game is to complete the post game as well. And as such, I had two and a half weeks, pushing three actually, just getting through the post game shit, getting some of the celestial weapons, beating Omega, getting all the Aeons, beating Penance, you know, Dark Aeons included obviously because that's the only way you can get to Penance, and beating Nemesis. I really had to spend a couple of days just devoted to Blitzball, which is that game's main mini game, and to get Tidus' Celestial Weapon, I spent a good few hours in one session and another with that annoying Chocobo mini game, that Chocobo race shit. And I have to say right now that I'm a little mixed on Final Fantasy X. I'm a lot more mixed than I thought I would be. Because it's a great game. In fact, it's better than I remembered it. But it's also, at some point, a very different game from the previous Final Fantasies. From many of the Final Fantasies that I played before, there's... In the centerpiece... In the pilgrimage, there's a vibe in the game that kind of throws me off. From what I'm used to experiencing when I'm playing a Final Fantasy game. This to me felt more like... A lot of people are going to say this, but Grandia. Well, let, me, let me get the lamp light on. Oh, hopefully I don't get like... Electrocuted or some bullshit like that. Okay. It's obligatory. If I'm going to do a review, I'm going to put the fucking lamplight on. Get a little bit of a spotlight going on. A ghetto spotlight. Anyways. A couple things I should say before I actually start reviewing this game. I had first gotten this game... In the summer of 2002. Now, I got a PlayStation 2 for my birthday in the year 2002 for my dad. And I've been just like slowly accumulating games. Towards the next month, I would get Kingdom Hearts and I would drop Final Fantasy X completely for Kingdom Hearts. But. Back then, the only games I had as a reference point for what a Final Fantasy looks like were 7, 8, and 9. And I also used my past experiences with games such as Beyond the Beyond and... Yeah, that, that was a fucked up series. That's not a series, it was just one game. And... I think I also used... Breath of Fire 4 and Jake Cocoon as reference points, but I wasn't expecting something like that anyway, since they didn't have world maps. The first few hours I was playing through Final Fantasy X, I thought, man, this was a really good game. And I noticed there were a lot of things that were really different. There was no level up feature. Instead, every time you accumulate enough AP points, which is like experience, you can move across the sphere grid, a grid that everyone's on, where you're all kind of locked into a path, but with the right keys, you can go into other people's sphere grid paths and move your stats around there. So it's a system where, in the beginning, everyone is a distinct character with a specific job level. Yuna being the white mage, Titus being sort of a warrior with a bit of a time mage 
attribute to him. He has haste. Haste to go slow, slow guy, I think. Aran just being the standard knight with a couple of armor breaking, mental breaking, power breaking abilities. You know, powerhouse, really. He can pierce through defense. I'll kind of put him in the samurai class. Waka. Waka's a weird guy. He's like ranged and shit. But I would kind of classify him as a saboteur because he has all these nice ass debuffs that he can use. He can blind people, stone people, put him to sleep with his attacks. He, he was really good, like, saboteur. Using Final Fantasy thirteen terminology, Lula obviously being the black mage, and Kamari being the definite blue mage, Riku, the alchemist. She will always be used as an alchemist. But towards the and that in post game you're going to end up getting each other's abilities minus the overdrive so you'll be identical even stat wise the stat progression in this game by the way is crazy like in the beginning your stats don't do shit because you get plus ones in each stat but towards the end getting 255 stats and with break damage limit you are you would go from dishing like the four nines, 9,999, which is like a testament to a classic Final Fantasy, to like 99,999. That shit is wild. And if you have some things that can bypass that, like some enemies can, Anima can like bypass that in a way. But that's only because her moves count the individual hits. We can do like a million or some ridiculous shit like that. I know enemies in this game can, that can heal for like six digits worth of hell hit points and that's that's amazing like they were really walling out when they made this game the stat progression stat progression is not like any of the other final fantasy games you get powerful really quickly and you get super powerful really quickly if you can grind for an obscenely long period of time but I was as I was playing through this game, my first playthrough, it dawned on me that this wasn't like any of the other Final Fantasy games for the most part. Now because of inclusion of voice acting, I knew a lot about this game because Toonami was hyping it up every single freaking day. Uh, there were some things I was expecting, but the minute I realized there was not going to be a world map, that there wasn't going to be like a standard leveling system, some of the things that I got used to in the game weren't going to remain in this portion. I thought, you know, fuck it, this this game is whack. My mom got so pissed because we did that spend good money on that shit. She said, you said that was whack? This game is whack? I'm like, you know what I mean. Second playthrough, I played through the game in 2005 for summer of 2005 with my best friend and in the first playthrough I got stuck in the first Seymour battle at this point I was able to get past that battle get into the second battle with Seymour and after that I got stuck there even though I could have just waited until I got reflect I didn't know that since I didn't use FAQs at the time and I didn't know about that sphere of the internet. It was until I learned about the FAQ side that I actually got into things like YouTube and all sorts of shenanigans like that. It really got me hooked on the internet. So I decided after getting that far, you know what? You're my best friend. We can give each other tons of things. Your stuff is mine. Here. I want you to beat this game on behalf of me. So I gave him the disc. Every, every all the parties involved, that was cool. And later on, he, his cousin helped him beat the game. And he told me all about it. But with his white lies, things are kind of difficult to explain. He was actually saying some ridiculous shit that I knew wasn't true. And later on, I would go on to confirm it. Like how there was this monster that encompasses a whole room and as you gradually fight him that room closes and there's like sharpness in it and 
you don't kill him in time, he wipes you out. That sounds like a really neat boss battle, but no, I don't think I don't think that was in the realm of this game. This third playthrough, I got myself the HD version because I woke up Monday morning, like in the 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3, 4, whatever a.m.s. The morning, it's not it's socially acceptable to wake up in. And I saw there was a Cyber Monday sale because I was following the Final Fantasy VIII page on Facebook. And as such, I figured, you know what, I'm, I'm about to cop some shit. So I saw what was available. A lot of it really didn't look like it was for me or I already had it. I think the cheapest shit was like the Final Fantasy XIII 2 and Landing Returns shit. But I had gotten myself the 10, 10 2 HD remaster because every time I saw it either in Target or Walmart in Pennsylvania, I thought, well there are a lot of Walmarts in Pennsylvania, but the one I was in, I thought, you know what, eventually I'm going to have to get this game. Eventually, I'm going to have to beat 10. I don't care about 10, 2, I'm going to beat 10. So I got that version. I played it from beginning to end. And now is where the review really starts. 11 minutes and 46 seconds in. The first thing is that they changed up the internet interface for this HD remake. Now, I don't know about you, but I hated the original interface. The original interface of Final Fantasy X was ugly. There were too many creamy-ass varying colors. It looked like Neapolitan ice cream. And it didn't look appropriate for a Final Fantasy game. Not at all. Whereas this version of the interface is fantastic. It doesn't look like a plug for a play online website. I always thought it was weird how when you went to when you booted up Final Fantasy X and you got to the sh title screen it said it had like a URL get like tips on not play Asia, play online it had the URL and everything. I'm like yo what the fuck? Who the fuck puts a URL in a title screen? Are you fucking crazy? That's gonna cheapen it. That's gonna make it look ghetto. That's why I thought the original interface was. It was ghetto. And they were trying too much when they should have just kept it like a standard Final Fantasy X. Here we got a nice shade of blue. Not the traditional Final Fantasy one, but like a more baby like, beautiful shades of blue. The interface looked fantastic. The font looked fantastic. I might prefer the original font, but still, it all goes together well. The backgrounds, the backgrounds look fantastic. Um, I think Yusuke Naora was in charge of the backgrounds. That should look beautiful. Backgrounds have really been improved, they've aged well. They're my favorite part visually of this game. The character models have improved. I mean, they didn't like fix the models or anything. Uh, in the Final Fantasy games, like in game, everyone kinda has mitts, they don't have hands. These fingers, they don't do shit. Even in Kingdom Hearts, the fingers move. They're like natural, here they just have mitts. That is if they're like the low res characters no one gives a fuck about. Which there's always gonna be low res characters in these new school Final Fantasy games. Even 13, like you know the other girls are like short and impish in Lightning Returns. Not just because they're not as beautiful as Lightning or any of the other main characters. The main characters have to look magnificent. They have to look damn near perfect. They have to have an athletic build. They have to have a weird mythological appearance and aura about them. And everyone else is kind of like short. 
uh, not really busty, just like, just like, um, insecure looking, like, that's the kind of look I would have if I'd be insecure of other girls, like, uh, there's competition out there, and I might not be able to compete as well. Other than that, uh, character models have mitts, but I really like the design for these guys. I think Tetsuya and Yusuke work together very well. Like, Waka has deep eye sockets. He's looking dull as fuck. Uh, I mean, everyone likes it, this how impractical the character designs from people of Sparrow are. And as to the costumes and the shit that they wear is stupid. However, backgrounds look really good. Uh, the back of Yuna's head no longer looks stupid. I really hated the back of Yuna's head in the original version. She had this big ass hair from the back. And it was like glossy as fuck. It didn't look good. Nowadays, everyone's hair looks great. The only fault of the HD version is that... Really, with the HD version, they're just putting a high-definition filter over everything. And a side effect of that, which you can see in the HD version of Final Fantasy VII, is that sometimes characters' mouths are permanently open, and it looks ridiculous. Now, I don't like when people have stupid facial expressions during cutscenes, because that looks ridiculous, and it... It's, it's kind of unflattering and unattractive, like, uh, Seymour's mom was the example of this. Some of the suburbs for Dark Aeons are an example of this. The fuck? Hold up. Had some of the nastiest not build up ever. That was you didn't need to experience that. But anyway, moving on from the visual side of things, because it's all Tetsuya and Namura stuff. I like it because it doesn't look like typical anime shit. Even though some people don't like his designs, they think that it's not as unique as Yoshitaka models. Play normal with JRPG like Grandia or Lunar or Game Arts games. Some of the Star Ocean games. They have the generic same face Anamu shit. This one, there's a little bit of variety. I think uh, maybe like Shadow Hearts can compete without their character designer. The one who designed the first three Shadow Hearts games in Kadelka. I really love that character design too. But it's different. That's why I like Tetsuya. Regardless, uh, the music. Three different composers Junja, Takano, Nobuo Omatsu, and Masashi Hamazuo. I dissed Masashi before, saying he's not as good of a composer as some of the other Square guys. Back when I was reviewing 13, and even then I thought it was unfair, but really, he is a great composer. You can look at his work in the Saga games, Saga Unlimited Saga and Saga Frontier 2. He's a talented man. He's a great composer. In fact, how a lot of songs from 13 were good, it's just that the overall work... I felt was extremely boring. And it really was. But the stuff he worked on here was really good. I don't really know Junja's style, but I haven't heard a bad track for this game. Nobuo Uematsu, when I hear Yuna's theme or any of the compositions that constantly move around in this game, I'm like, yo, those riffs sound really familiar, especially towards the closing scenes and the opening scenes, the closing scenes, when the compos 
the composer starts to go crazy, and there's like an aspect of every song that really touches on what's happening in the scene, and it sounds like this big epic moment where a director can really do some damage and get us interested in these CG cutscenes. Like after you beat Yu Yevin, spoiler alert. I thought that was amazing. I thought his style was amazing. Oh my god, that's Nubuo, alright. I know Nubuo when I hear it. I've, I've done played all these games. I can pick it up. I can pick up the sound, the riffs, the little cliches. That's him. And that's just stuff that keeps reminding me this is a Final Fantasy game. Storyline wise, and this is something I'm going to touch on before I actually review like the last odds and ends, bits and bobs. Storyline wise, this game took forever in terms of the storyline to get good for me. Middle part, there was this like shit sandwich. A lot of that is because they have to explain all these aspects of the storyline to Titus. And it became more about the setting than it really did about any of the drama. Now, I really like parts of the game where I had to like crash a wedding or kill the undead or some shit like that. But really, for the, there's like a big portion of this game where the plot goes down the shitter. And it's all about explaining parts of the setting, which... I thought the setting was great. They worked really hard on making this a fantasy game that's not like all the other medieval, pseudo medieval settings. And I like how this game is all about really challenging the idea of what is a fantasy game, which is something that Yoshinori Katase felt like doing because a lot of people feel like 7 and 8 were too futuristic to be fantasy games. They had to be in this, at least Victorian era, at least early 20th century shit. Like, the beginning of the 20th century before World War One and shit. But no, he like, and combined all these aspects of Asian and African culture, and really made a exotic game that was, in fact, a fantasy game. And that's part of the reason why I think this game is so grandia like The save points automatically heal you. Battle system is, like, conditional. It's not like everyone has a specific round. Agility really makes a big point of this game, although oh, there's no like move feature or move stat like in Grandia or Lunar. So that's one thing that separates this game from that. The fact that the main character is like this as he's not a normal guy, he's like a celebrity in his world. But he's not a fighter, so a lot of aspects of this game kind of seem Grandia esque. How upbeat the music can be as opposed to previous Final Fantasy installments like six through nine where I felt there was a large theme of darkness and you know last shit did remind me of Grandia I'm gonna be honest I ain't gonna lie I think what sealed the deal is the fact that there's no world map the same way there was in the previous Final Fantasies sure there's kind of a world map near the end but it's sort of like okay Pick your destination. Alright, we're going there. Let's drive you guys up to that area in the airship. thought that was weird. I really did. But, with all that being said, I don't want to diss Grandia, and I don't want to diss this game. Their similarities are endearing more than anything else. Now, to finally conclude everything by actually critiquing the battle system, I did like the fact that they had a conditional battle system, even though it meant that 
a lot of battles would be a lot more dull because the ATB added a t feeling of tension. You had to do things in a certain time or even if it was on weight mode, there was still that feeling of tension that waiting for the gauge to fill up and shit. And I really didn't get that here. Instead, I got like another form of tension, which is having to deal with enemies that can delay you or that can slow you down, get like a bunch of turns on you, having to do the same thing to them. The concept of stealing turns from your enemies or like really doubling your speed so you can get more turns in them, I thought that was really cool. I liked the concept of agility, especially towards endgame, where I felt as if you were really just like bashing away your enemies and using the brute force smith fit. And there was an, there was like a sense of excitement in that. And wrapping all your strategies around using that as opposed to everything else. In the beginning, this game is pretty tactical. You could really use all sorts of magic and alchemy and mix things up as much as you want. You really be a savage soir, but towards the end of the game, everyone's immune to everything. Your post-game enemies. Um, it's all about being faster than them. None of them are as fast as them. Basking them away with quick hit. And that kind of... That was a good thing and a bad thing. H.C. Bailey said that he kind of misses being able to use crowd control or to really debuff his enemies or having to buff his characters, which is still important for fights like Penance and Nemesis, actually. Penance especially if you need to get an ultra null no all or use cheer five times. That's really important, but... It ultimately all becomes about brute force, about smashing your characters with quick hit. Strategy of the main game all vanishes once you get to the post game. And the fact that they got rid of the level up system to me kind of killed this game too in a couple of ways because it takes forever to grind. Usually I would remove a level up feature if I didn't want characters to really, I really didn't want you to grind all that much. But in this game, especially once you get to the post game, it's really grindy. It's not nearly as grindy as Final Fantasy XIII. That game was grindy as fuck. You had to really go through all your enemies to be at the appropriate levels. You really had to like do extra sometimes. But in this game, like strategy is. I mean, grinding is a. Like, it takes way too long. Like, it shouldn't take me nearly three weeks of preparation to get to the super bosses. I had to max out my strength. My strength for some of my characters was like in its 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And then I had to boost that shit up to 255. With like nodes that would sometimes add like one, two, three, or four points. I had to steal it from some monsters, some of which I may not be fully ready to face to get like extra strength. I had to boost up my agility to at least 170. Past that, it's actually redundant. It doesn't do anything for you. Defense, magic defense, luck, I just had to get it to at least 85. It was extremely grinding. It took a lot of time I spend way too much time in the monster arena, more time than I should have for a post game. Just to get to a super two super boss fights that were actually pretty fun. It had me on my toes. In this version, because Quick Hit is a little bit nerfed, Nemesis is actually a fun battle. I expected to cream him and I got owned more times than I did with Penance. Penance I only like got owned once. But this guy, I think I got on four times, five times, not three times, though. Definitely four times. And I had fun. But it took forever.
I feel as if if there was an actual level up feature and it did move the way the AP did and you just gain the strength by the fours towards the end until you can get to max strength, that would have been fantastic. I would just go through Omega Ruins and some of the monster arena guys have to worry about all that BS. But instead it just it just started to blow mines. Having to grind up to get my sphere levels up, building up that AP, and then I just move across the grid where thankfully if it's already a path you've crossed, you don't need as much sphere points to traverse, but still that took forever, even with the Don Tomberry trick to be honest. Because the Don Tomberry trick really doesn't become useful until you get the right weapons. Weapons that have not just overdrive AP, that's kind of easy, but triple overdrive and double AP, that kind of shit. Otherwise, it's going to be good, but it's not going to be as great as people make it to be. And that's really my biggest criticism. My criticism with the game being that it's grindy towards the end and gradually becomes more about brute force than anything else. And that really the setting dominates any form of plot or storytelling for the most part in the middle, middle of the game. Kind of alienates us from the series. I didn't really like using the Aeons all that much, but they actually made it a bit engaging. Unlike all the previous times, so I did use them usually to finish an enemy off or as a scapegoat or to soften up an enemy during the main game. Mostly towards the end as a scapegoat for guys like Anima. But other than that, it was actually a really good game. This was a fantastic game. It has a lot more atmosphere than I expected from the beginning and the end of the game. Mid game, not so much until like Spoiler alert, you see Yuna and Titus, like, fuck. But that's about it. There's not a lot of atmosphere in this setting. It's really just from the middle part, but really it's at its peak for a Final Fantasy game from the beginning and near the end. Uh, it, it's a good game. It's what I think of subconsciously when I think of the early 2000s. Whereas 8 would probably be what I think of in the late 90s and 7 mid 90s. Anyway, it has been Mr. Monka 7. This video is 33 minutes and some irrelevant shit long. It's been way too long. This is a great game. I recommend you play it. But don't go crazy on it. Don't try to do like post game shit. That that'll take like, the rest of your life away. I really had to plan this shit. I had to spend a specific hours each day doing something. I actually had like a mental schedule for myself. But other than that, you will probably have fun playing this game if you know what you're doing. Anyway, guys, fuck all that irrelevant shit. Suck.